I want to say. Okay, so before we start, before we start this stuff, I'm just going to go over the remainder of the semester so you have an idea what we're going to do. Um, and then from there, I'll just quickly finish lecture 14, which we started last uh, lecture, and then go over the exam. If you did really bad in the exam, please come. Well, anyone can come, but I want the people that got below 50 to come see me, 50%. So if you got 11 on 24 or below, come see me, okay? Uh, maybe you have problems at home, or maybe it's just you're not studying and you're partying every day, or maybe you really don't understand the material, right? So come see me so we can figure out what type of mistakes you're making and uh, what are we going to do about it, okay? If you don't care, don't come, but I'm pretty sure that students do care, okay? So that's that. The rest, you're also wel welcome, but hopefully by looking at the, at the, the answers today, you'll have an idea. And so mm -hmm. you'll know what type of mistake you make. Okay, that's the first thing. So speaking of the midterm, this is actually surprising. So this this is the curve I was expecting, and this is what we're getting. Um, your seems to be a little bit too easy here, but that's okay. We'll keep it like this. Um, this is what the university expects at the end of the semester. Okay, we have a few people that are in the top here. Um, not that many uh, low grades, but still we have to deal with this group here. Okay, well, I have. Make sense? So the, you can expect something similar for the final. Um, maybe uh, I'll, all your input that you gave me, I'll include it, okay? Um, and I'll make the questions more mine, let's say, okay? Uh, what else? So that's for that. Um, the semester, okay. So for the semester, we are right here. Next week, so next week there's no quiz. You're just gonna do a tuto uh, tutorial of problems on chapter eight, and then the quiz will be in this week on chapter eight. Yeah. Um, so can you the last day? No, it will still remain five. Uh, let me get to that. So um, second, this week here, we'll do the quiz on chapter eight. We'll also do a quiz here. Now here, Monday, we don't have school, but I'll do the quiz online probably for everyone on the third. Okay? Take notes, guys. There's also another quiz, quiz on the week the, of uh, April 8th, and then that will be the last quiz. This means that you'll have a total of nine quizzes. I'm still counting the best five. Okay? Now students want to remove it and put four and all that, I'm not going to do that. I'm giving you a lot of bonus assignments. We're going to keep it as is. We already removed too much. We moved too much. That's it. Okay. The 16th, the 16th, we have a makeup date. I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but we'll see closer to that date. Okay. Hopefully nothing. So you can have a day off. But if we have to catch up, we'll catch up on the 16th. Your exam is on the 23rd. Make sense? Three more quizzes, a few more chapters, and uh, the quiz on the week of the first is going to be uh, online. Cool? Okay, that's that. What else? Still shaking, man. Too much adre adrenaline. Les enfants, les Anyways, uh, let's get to the lecture, okay? So it should be quite quick. I'm just going to reuse the same stuff there. I didn't finish last lecture. Um, so we're going to basically start from... Hopefully you guys watched the lecture I posted online so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about today. I'll give a quick review before I get into the eukaryotic uh, transcription. So in transcription, you have a... Start by here. So in transcription, when you're converting DNA to RNA, you have this RNA polymerase. So we're talking in prokaryotes right now, so bacteria, okay? You have an RNA polymerase that is composed of five subunits, two alpha, two beta, and one omega, plus an additional, an additional protein that come together and transcribe the gene, okay? Sigma 70 here is a protein that recognizes a specific sequence on the DNA, which is at the promoter of a gene, okay? And then it will recruit this polymerase, which will then start transcri transcribing the gene. 
In the promoter, there's two important regions that you have to remember, the Tara box and this sequence here, okay? So the promoter is the part that tells you where a gene is and where RNA polymerase binds. And then at the end of the promoter, that's where transcription starts, okay? So transcription starts here and then continues until the end of the gene and a bit beyond the gene up to here, okay? It's not shown on this diagram, but usually it goes on a little bit longer than the coding sequence. From this, you will make an mRNA. This mRNA, because it's prokaryotic, it does not contain introns, okay, which are just non-coding sequences, but it contains two parts, the five prime UTR here and the three prime UTR, which is not shown here. And these are just called the untranslated region because the mRNA has this sequence but it's not translated into a protein. Translation happens at the start codon of the coding sequence of a gene, which is ATG. And ATG makes methionine. We'll see this next lecture. So that's that. So then we start with the gene like this on the DNA. You don't transcribe the promoter. What you transcribe is just the part right after, and then the the, uh, what do you call it? The ribosome will recognize just this part and make the protein from here, okay? Now the uh, sigma, uh, sigma 70 recognizes this sequence here, right? And there's two parts to it, the Tata box and the TTGA, whatever, you don't need to remember it. But these are found 10 nucleotides upstream of the start site of transcription. And 35 nucleotides upstream of the start site. So that's that. There are different sigma proteins that target different sequences, okay? So this is for sigma 70, but there are others like sigma 52, et cetera, and they target different types of genes. So that's that. When that happens, then uh, sigma 70 is removed from the uh, sequence, and then this RNA polymerase will uh, start moving along the DNA sequence and transcribing only the gene that it's targeting, nothing else. So remember, DNA replication goes through the whole DNA, Transcription only happens at specific sites along the DNA where you find genes. And it can happen on both uh, sequences, on both uh, strands. Some genes are transcribed this way and others are transcribed this way. Okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then at the end, you need to know when the gene stops, right? And so at the end here, there is a sequence that is uh, going to form a hairpin loop. This is a 2D structure. It's like a, it's basically a, a loop of the RNA binding to itself. And why does it bind to itself? It's because it has complementary uh, sequences on both sides. So the sequence will be, will go from here. So the transcript is being built. Then you have this sequence here, which is kind of similar to each other. And it will form this hairpin loop. Now this herpin loop will allow the release of the RNA polymerase from the DNA and the termination of transcription, okay? One other important section of this uh, RNA molecule is the poly U sequence here after the herpin loop, okay? This is found in all um, RNAs that undergo termination by herpin loop. Is it clear up to now? I'm going a bit fast because no, we have stuff to do. The other part is the row, the other type of termination is the row dependent termination. And the row dependent termination is actually caused by a protein, uh, uh, a hexamer, so six similar subunits uh, that are called row, and they will recognize a sequence that is highly rich in terms of cytosine and low in terms of guanine. And it will start moving along the DNA because it has an uh, the RNA because it has a helicase function. It moves faster than the RNA polymerase, so it will reach it and kick it out, okay? There's no poly U sequence here. There's no herpin loop, nothing. Remember this. Okay, at least we skip. Okay, transcription in eukaryotes. It's a bit more complex because there's not only one RNA polymerase, there's three of them and uh, Actually, there's uh, more variations, but just assume there's three. And then these three don't have only five subunits. They have between 12 to 17 subunits, okay? 
You don't need to remember these subunits or what they do or, okay? You just need to remember that there's three different RNA polymerases and uh, that RNA in this case is um, modified and we'll see the modifications that happen before it's being, uh, it's transported to the cytoplasm. In prokaryotes, I think I'm talking about this soon. I'll get back to this. Um, the other thing is in prokaryotes, the DNA is organized into chromatin, which is just condensed version of DNA with proteins. And so it's kind of, um, depending on where the chromatin is open, there will be transcription or not. If there is no, the chromatin is closed, what happens is that the RNA polymerase cannot transcribe those genes. So you need to open the structure before, uh, before being able to transcribe a certain gene. Now this is what happens here. You only need to remember that there is the same Tata box, okay, it's very important where the RNA polymerase binds, and that there is between 12 to, uh, 12 to what? 12 to 17 subunits, okay? And uh, the other thing is that in, uh, in eukaryotes, there's sequences that can be upstream or downstream of the DNA, far from the promoter, that can serve as regulators of transcription. For example, enhancers and silencers. And you'll see this um, in the future, I think. Don't remember if we'll cover it in this course, but probably, probably in the lack of prawn. I'm not sure, I will have to check this, okay? So enhancers, what they do is that they promote transcription. So let's say, for example, you have basal levels of transcription. The RNA polymerase comes in and binds, and then starts transcribing. And then you have this enhancer that binds to the enhancer region on the DNA, and suddenly it just twists a little bit the DNA, and your RNA polymerase binds more efficiently to the DNA and becomes more efficient at transcribing, transcribing and much faster. Okay, and this is just an example. Silencers could block RNA polymerase from kind of walking on the DNA. Okay, this is one of the examples. And we'll see this. One more important experiment that we have to talk about is how we found that RNA synthesis takes place in the nucleus, um, in eukaryotes, and that protein synthesis is in the cytoplasm. Yep. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, because that's where the RNA polymerase will bind. It will find that sequence and bind to it. There's this protein called the Tata box binding protein, TBP, which binds here. Okay. Not necessary for you guys, but just to give you an example. And that protein will recruit the whole complex. Okay. Uh, this is the whole complex of transcription. Same, same, same idea. You have Tata box, protein binds here, recruits all the other proteins, which allows for this uh, RNA polymerase to start moving along the uh, DNA. That's pretty much it. So for the experiment, we had, um, so there's a group that did this pulse chase uh, reaction in cells. So they added ra radioactive uracil, which is a component of RNA, but not DNA. And then they allowed the RNA to be synthesized. And then when you just look under a uh, autoradiograph, you can see that the RNA first is in the nucleus and then goes outside of the nucleus, right? And this just shows you that it's made here, but then has a function outside of the nucleus, okay? Eukaryot, uh, prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, and so transcription and translation happen at the same time. While the RNA molecule is coming out, translation of that protein, uh, of that RNA molecule is happening at the same time. And this is what it looks like. Um, Pretty much in your, what I said just said right now. So you have the DNA being uh, transcribed, and then the ribosomes, whenever they have a chance, they will start binding to the uh, RNA and start making protein. While in eukaryotes, because there's a nucleus, these two processes are separate, and so the RNA has to be processed first and has to be mature before going outside. And this is why. There's no introns here and there's introns here, okay? If you had introns here, that would mess up the sequence of the protein, right? 
And so in this case, processing happens before, which is removing introns, tapping, and polyadenylation. I'll show you that in a second. And then it goes out the nucleus and gets translated into the protein. Now, there's another difference that's important. DNA replication happens only once, but transcription and translation happen nonstop. That means you can have a thousand RNA polymerases going one after the other on the same gene. Okay? But you can't have that for RNA replication, uh, for DNA replication, because you can only make N equal N2, 2 anamine, uh, and then split the cells, right? So, uh, for anamine. Okay. So DNA replication only happens once, right? So you have the DNA replication happening once and you have only two copies of the genome, right? So you have your DNA polymerase binding to the DNA and making a copy of the DNA and that's it. Cell split, that, that's all. RNA polymerase, it's a different story because you need a lot of the protein, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 copies, then you'll have multiple RNA polymerases coming one after the other on the same gene and making thousands of copies to make thousands of mRNAs, okay? In, so if you see in the notes, I uh, skipped a little bit about the, uh, the last part of the book, and that's because it's way too complex. Uh, so for the last part of the book, all you need to know is what I'm gonna tell you right now here. Um, so there's a few things that happen when the mRNA is being built. The first thing is that the mRNA is capped. What do I mean by capped? There is, um, there is, so the five prime end of the mRNA, uh, there is a seven methyl guanosine that is added to the end. And this is important for preventing degradation of the RNA molecule, as well as for translation. So the ribosomes kind of need this. And this happens because RNA polymerase has a C-terminal domain. So when you have it a protein, the end term is the first part, the C term is the end, and then you have the middle part. So the C term contains a lot of these phosphorylated uh, groups which attract these capping enzymes. And so while the RNA molecule is coming out, these capping enzymes will bind here and cap the mRNA. Okay, this is, yeah. Uh, the capping eukaryote. Yeah. The second thing, uh, sorry, I forgot something about the capping. So the seven methyl guanosine looks like this. Okay. And uh, the capping happens from the five prime to five prime direction, which means that the first base in the RNA molecule, the five prime carbon, there will be a seven. Uh, methyl guanosine added to it. Okay, so this is why five prime to five prime. Make sense? Going super fast today, okay? But uh, I think you already saw this before, so it should be okay. If you have any questions, stop me. By the way, still uh, on the adrenaline, going like that. <laughs> uh, anyways, so one last thing is the termin uh, the so the termination. So at the end of the, again, while the mRNA molecule is coming out, there are other proteins that are added at the end uh, on the C-term domain that will add a poly-A tail. And this poly-A tail is just a tail to the mRNA with a lot of A's to it, okay? Uh, the poly-A tail is about 100 to 50 to 200 uh, A's. And it's just used uh, to protect the DNA again from uh, degradation, the RNA, sorry. What else? You don't need to remember these termination sites by heart. Okay, there's no point in this. So remember AAU, AAA. Um, in the translation lectures, you'll have to remember at least the start codon and stop codons because they're important. Uh, but other than that, these sequences have useless. So this is part of the RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase, you can imagine it as a complex protein. Uh, part of it, the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase looks like this. And it has a lot of phosphorylated 
uh, amino acids, so probably serine, tyrosine, or three in, uh, or threonine. You don't need to know this. It's the ones that get phosphorylated, and they allow for the recruitment of these proteins. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. At the end, basically. Yeah. Cool. And uh, so there's this sequence that I told you about at the end of the mRNA molecule, which is this here. 20 bases downstream, there's a protein called an endonucleus, which will just come and cut it there. there. And this will make your transcript. This is called a pre-mRNA, because there's one more, and then obviously there's the poly A tail that's added, okay? Yep. Uh, before the splicing of introns, so basically after the methyl guanosine is added and after the cleavage and poly A tail addition, that's called pre-mRNA. And then you have the intron splicing, which we'll talk about soon. Uh, which then makes the mRNA. Okay, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're basically trimming the mRNA to remove the useless stuff at the end. Yeah. 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 After the addition of poly A tail. This is the, this year. After. This, st this still contains uh, introns, okay? So when you remove the introns, then it becomes the mRNA, what's used by the ribosome for uh, producing the protein. Okay, so now you have your uh, cap that is added. Um, some, oh, did I mix these? Somewhere along the end of the production of this mRNA, there is another machinery that comes in, the splicing machinery that will remove all the introns, okay? And the introns are just non-coding regions, and when you remove the introns, then you can, you can call it an mRNA molecule. Anything before that is pre-mRNA. Cool? You can also call it the spliceosome, this group of molecules that splice the RNA. So this is what it looks like. Um, the red is the actual final mRNA, right? And so most of it is actually introns. Very little is coding. And so when you remove that, you can see that it's much shorter. Okay. One last thing. So you have exons. You have introns in between. The spliceosome recognizes this GU, AG, sequence, which is at the extremities of an intron, and cuts right there, okay, GUAG. So when you're making your mRNA, in the pre-mRNA, I mean, uh, you have this GUAG, and there's cutting that happens here. And then these will be ligated together, the exons. Why, why is it not this one here? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think it still happens at the others, and it makes uh, these uh, useless proteins, um, which get degraded. So I think it still happens here. Um, and you can see probably the frequency of occurrence here. I think they're referring to the um, amount of chances that it will happen here, right? Because what happens is that as the mRNA is coming out, the first thing that appears is this one here, not this one here, right? Uh, so there will be splicing here first most of the time. I, I'm not sure. I'm, maybe I'm saying some random stuff, but I think this is it. Okay, this is the first part exposed, and this part is exposed after, and so probably these are the. Anyways, this is the first part exposed. Uh, this is where splicing happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everything is uh, the same time. <laughs> Whenever the protein finds the occasion to kind of jump in, it will do it. Right. Uh, one last thing, I think, or two, two last things. 
before we go over the exam. So um, there's uh, there are a few. Pro so this is just extra for you. It's just the interesting part of the lecture. Okay, there are a lot of introns. So there's a lot of DNA that is pretty much useless. We don't know what it does. Okay, most of it is non-coding, um, and usually it's found in introns. There's a gene called the Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy gene. Obviously, if you have a mutation in it, probably you have this disease. This gene has 79 exons and 78 introns. Usually you have like seven or five, something like this. So it's a huge gene and it has about 2.5 million base pairs, but the mRNA is only 14,000 base pairs. So you can see that the DNA is actually, at least for now, we don't know what the hell it's there for. Okay. Uh, most of it is pretty useless according to our understanding. There's another gene called the tropomyosin gene, which is important for uh, actin. And you can see that depending on the tissue where you, you, it is expressed, you have different variants. So this is the actual gene. And then there are splice variants, what we call, depending on where splicing happens. You can get different combination of exons, and these will lead to it being expressed in different tissues. right? And these exons, some of them have functions, some of them don't. Some of them are important for localization, some of them are not. So you can see that for the striated muscle compared to this one here, uh, smooth muscle, maybe this exon here is important for localizing the protein right in this type of muscle or something like that. This is just a hypothetical. But uh, these splicing variants exist a lot in genes and they s modify the protein in a way that's important for specific processes. Yeah, that's it. Okay, Speedy Gonzalez teaching right here. Let's get to the uh, the exam, okay? You have any questions? No? Yep. Uh, no, there's no introns in you, prokaryotes. 